friends, health buffs, and even our own mama told us to eat whole grain this, fat free that. Why? Because they were supposed to be good for you. But should we believe them? These are the superfoods that, as it turns out, aren't so super at all. They said margarine was better than butter until they didn't. You probably don't hear much about it now, but back when I was a little boy, every mom in the neighborhood would swear by it. They'd tell you it was cheaper and healthier than butter, and they'd say things like, Oh, it's made from vegetable oil. It's got no cholesterol. It's heart healthy. Everyone was convinced it was this magical superfood that would keep your ticker going strong. I remember my mom slathering it on toast every morning, and the commercials on TV sure didn't hurt its reputation. If you've tried it before, you know it can't hold a candle to butter. Why? Because the butter would melt. Jokes aside, margarine always tasted a bit, I don't know, off, kind of greasy, a little plasticky, and the texture was strange, like it just wanted to sit there on your tongue without melting properly. Even as a kid, I could tell there was something missing from it, something natural, you know? That should have been a dead giveaway right there. Margarine wasn't the savior they made it out to be. Years later, we found out all those trans fats in it were a lot worse than what we were trying to avoid. Instead of helping your heart, it was clogging it up. All those years thinking we were making a smart choice, only to find out it was doing the opposite. Sometimes these super foods just turn out to be too good to be true. I'll stick with butter on my toast, thank you very much. It seemed like everywhere you turned in the 70s, someone was talking about wheatgrass. Juice bars started showing up all over the place, and they were pushing these little shots of the green stuff like it was liquid gold. The people back then swore it was the key to eternal youth or something. They say it's packed with vitamins, it'll detoxify your body, boost your energy, make you feel invincible, all that jazz. They made it sound like it could cure everything but a broken heart. Now, I'll be honest, I too fell victim to the trend. Had me a shot or two and full disclosure, I was not impressed by it. The taste of wheatgrass was, well, let's just say it was an acquired taste. And I never did acquire it. It tasted like someone had just mowed the lawn and decided to squeeze the clippings into a glass. It was like chewing on the earth itself. Real bitter and grassy with a little kick to the back of your throat, but turns out, wheatgrass wasn't the wonder tonic we thought it was. Sure, it had some vitamins and chlorophyll, but nothing you couldn't get from eating a few leafy greens. All those claims about detoxification and boosting your immune system were mostly just hype. There wasn't much science to back up the idea that it did anything magical. In fact, a lot of the supposed benefits came more from folks just believing it worked. A placebo effect, plain and simple. But man, did it have its moment in the sun. Whole grain, there's a term that sure got to work out over the years. I remember when the whole whole grain craze really took off. Suddenly, everything from cereal to bread to snacks was plastered with that label. Health freaks were all about it. Seemed like every expert on the subject was promoting it like it was the holy grail of nutrition. Now, don't get me wrong, whole grains are healthy. They've got fiber, vitamins, all that good stuff that's better for you than the processed white bread we used to chow down on. But the problem is, companies saw an opportunity and boy did they run with it. They started slapping whole grain on anything and everything just to make their products sound healthier you'd pick up a box of sugary cereal or crackers and they'd be boasting about the whole grains in there like it was some kind of health food. They figured if folks saw whole grain on the label, they'd think it was a free pass to eat as much as they wanted. But half the time, those so-called whole grain products tasted just like the same old processed junk, only with a few flecks of grain thrown in for good measure. The companies were banking on people not noticing, and to be fair, a lot of us didn't at first. Putting whole grain label on a box of cookies or some heavily processed food doesn't magically make it healthy. Let me say it again, whole grains are good for you, but they gotta be part of a balanced diet. You can't load them up with sugar or fat and expect them to do you any good. 
Corporations took a genuinely healthy thing and cheapened it, ran it into the ground with marketing hype. After a while, you didn't know what was actually good for you and what was just a clever way to sell more snacks. But then again, isn't that the way it always goes? Dark chocolate was one of those foods they really tried to convince us was a secret superfood. They said it was this magical treat that wasn't just indulgent, but actually good for you. They made it sound like you could eat your way to good health by gobbling up a square of the darkest chocolate you could find. Even my mom was eating it every day. I'll tell you though, dark chocolate's got a bite to it. It's not like that smooth, sweet milk chocolate most of us went for at the supermarket. Dark chocolate's more bitter, intense almost. You either loved it or you didn't, and for a lot of folks it took some getting used to. Personally, I liked it in small doses, but I could never wrap my head around eating it like a health supplement. Dark chocolate does have some health benefits, but like whole grain foods, they sure overstate it a bit much. It's got antioxidants, and if you eat the real dark stuff, like 70% cacao and up, it's better than milk chocolate. But people were almost treating it like medicine, like it was a miracle cure for whatever illness you could think of. Problem is, most of the dark chocolate folks were eating was still packed with sugar and fat, and all those benefits they talked about mostly came from eating just a tiny amount, like a square or two, not a whole bar. At the end of the day, dark chocolate is still chocolate. So, while it's not all bad, it's no golden ticket to health. But hey, at least it wasn't as bad as some of the other superfoods out there. You could do worse than a little bit of dark chocolate with your afternoon coffee. Not too long ago, folks couldn't stop talking about gluten like it was the devil himself wrapped up in a slice of bread. People started cutting it out left and right, even if they didn't have celiac disease or any real intolerance. It got branded as the black sheep of the nutrition family, and suddenly, every store shelf was stocked with gluten-free everything. Bread, pasta, you name it. Thing is, Unless you've got an actual sensitivity, gluten's not all that bad. It's just a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. It gives bread that chewy texture and helps things hold together. But when folks started shunning it, gluten-free bread became the go-to replacement. People say it's better for digestion and that it helps fight bloating, but they didn't mention what you were really getting into. Gluten-free bread can actually contribute to weight gain. Yeah, that's right. You see, to make up for the lack of gluten, a lot of these breads are packed with extra calories, sugar, and fat just to make them taste halfway decent. And if you're eating this stuff regularly, thinking you're being healthier, you might actually be doing yourself more harm than good. All those additives can sneak up on you and before you know it, that healthy bread could be packing on the pounds. I'm appalled at how these so-called healthy options can be a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Press pause and tell us which products at the supermarket mislead us shoppers. When you're done, let's get back to the video. Back in the day, cereal was practically its own food group. Every morning, kids would sit down with a big old bowl, pour in some milk, and listen to grown-ups tell us how good it was for us. Breakfast was supposed to be the most important meal, and cereal was the crown jewel. Brands really milked it too. Boxes of Cap'n Crunch and Apple Jacks practically jumped at you from the shelves with claims about being full of vitamins. Now, as a kid, I didn't care about the vitamins or minerals. I cared about the sugar. And that's exactly the problem. Most cereals tasted sweet. I'm talking sugary enough to send you into orbit. Even the so-called healthy ones were basically just sugar in disguise. That crunchy, satisfying bite was what I loved, but I had no idea that my balanced breakfast was more like a dessert. The sugary frosted flakes, the marshmallow bits, the neon colored puffs tasted like a party in a bowl. And don't get me started on the leftover milk, it'd turn into liquid candy. The problem is, most of those cereals that were pushed as healthy were anything but. Even the most honest ones were still loaded with sugar and artificial ingredients. They'd fortify it with a few vitamins, sure, 
but the trade-off is a lot of empty calories that could spike your blood sugar. And we didn't know it back then, but all that sugar-packed cereal was setting us up for energy crashes later in the day. Not to mention, if you ate enough of it, that could lead to weight gain or even health problems down the road. It's wild to think about how cereal got sold to us as the healthy go-to breakfast option, when in reality it was more like eating candy for breakfast. There are some better options these days with less sugar and more fiber, but even now you gotta watch out for all the marketing spin. Just because a box says it's healthy doesn't always mean it's doing you any favors. At one point in time, people were treating kale was the second coming of vegetables. All of a sudden, everyone was buzzing about it. You couldn't go anywhere without seeing kale on a menu. Kale salads, kale chips, kale smoothies. It was everywhere. To me, kale was tough, a little bitter, and kind of chewy. You couldn't just munch on it like spinach or lettuce. You had to massage it with oil just to make it halfway edible in a salad. If this was the future of vegetables, we're in for a rough ride. Even if you dress it up with enough seasoning or throw it in a smoothie, it always had that earthy, almost grassy bite to it that wasn't exactly love at first taste. The funny thing is, while kale is good for you, it's high in fiber, vitamins A, C, and K, and has all those antioxidants. It's not as nutrient-packed as advertised. Folks treated it like it was the only vegetable worth eating. But the truth is, kale's not that special. It's just another leafy green. And while it's nutritious, it's not this magical superfood that can transform your health overnight. Plus, there's only so much kale you can eat before your stomach starts to fight back. Another thing people didn't talk about was that eating kale in massive amounts could even cause problems, especially if you've got thyroid issues. It's one of those vegetables that can mess with your thyroid function if you overdo it, and that's something most folks didn't know when they were blending it into smoothies like there was no tomorrow. Kale's a good veggie, no doubt about it, but it was oversold to the point where it felt like you had to eat it or you weren't being healthy. But I've lived long enough to know you can't pin all your health hopes on one leafy green. It's all about balance. Kale was just another one of those superfoods that got turned into a fad, and like most fads, it lost some of its luster once people realized it wasn't quite as miraculous as they were led to believe. Popular with the active bunch, granola became the darling of the health food world. Granola was supposed to be the epitome of healthy living. After cereal got exposed for being too sugary, all you would hear was that granola was the perfect pick-me-up. Granola bars, granola cereal, granola sprinkled on yogurt, it was everywhere, especially when people started getting all into the natural foods movement. The worst part was, granola tastes great. It's crunchy, sweet, and has that toasted, nutty flavor that makes it feel like a personal reward more than anything. Throw in a handful of almonds, and it felt like a wholesome snack. How could you go wrong with oats, honey, and nuts, right? But here's the thing, it was too good. That sweetness? It didn't just come from a drizzle of honey. A lot of granola was packed with added sugar and oils to give it that irresistible crunch and flavor. And granola is dense in calories. A small serving could hit you with a few hundred calories. People would dump huge amounts on their yogurt or in a bowl with milk, thinking it was like adding air. If we only knew. All those calories and sugars added up fast, especially in those pre-packaged bars. The other problem is that not all granola was created equal. A lot of the store-bought stuff was so processed that it was pretty far removed from the simple homemade oats and nuts mix it started out as. By the time it hit the shelves, granola was loaded with extra sugar, preservatives, and fat. When folks were in a full-blown war against fat, they turned to fat-free yogurt. Every product on the grocery store shelf seemed to suddenly have a fat-free label slapped on it, and yogurt was its biggest victim. People really thought if they cut out the fat, they were doing themselves a big favor. While everyone was busy making their entire diet fat-free, they didn't tell you that fat isn't the enemy. It's the type of fat that matters. The fats in regular yogurt, especially if it's from good quality sources, aren't the heart-clogging kind. In fact, the fat helps your body absorb vitamins and keeps you feeling fuller longer. 
but back then people were terrified of fat so they swapped it out for sugar, which as you know, isn't exactly an upgrade. Too much sugar is just as bad, if not worse, for weight gain and heart health. The irony is, people thought fat-free yogurt would help them lose weight, but with all that sugar, it could do the opposite. You'd eat a cup of fat-free yogurt, feel hungry an hour later, and reach for something else to fill the gap. The coconut craze took on a life of its own. There was a point when it seemed like everything was infused with coconut oil. And I can't really blame them. You can cook with it, moisturize with it, even use it for pulling toxins out of your mouth. What's not to love? Cooking with coconut oil gives this tropical nutty smell in the kitchen. The taste was a bit richer and sweeter than other oils, and it did have its appeal. People loved to say it was this healthy fat that could do no wrong. Some folks even put it in their coffee for energy. But coconut oil is still a saturated fat, about 90% actually. And while it's not as bad as the old school saturated fats like lard, too much coconut oil can raise your cholesterol. So while it's fine to use in moderation, slathering it on everything like people were doing wasn't the wisest move for your ticker. Then there's coconut water. That stuff became the drink of choice for anyone looking to stay hydrated in style. It was branded as nature's perfect sports drink. It's supposed to be hydrating, full of electrolytes, and most of all, way better than those sugary Gatorades. It had this mildly sweet, refreshing taste with a bit of an island vibe and was supposed to be packed with potassium and electrolytes. And, as an added bonus, they taste like a tropical vacation. Coconut water does have some benefits. It's lower in sugar than soda or those neon-colored sports drinks, and it does have potassium, which is good for you. But the truth is, unless you're running marathons or working out for hours, you're not really sweating out enough electrolytes to need a special drink like that. And like with the others, the amount of sugar in a lot of store-bought coconut waters can add up quick, meaning it's not as guilt-free as it seems. Just plain old water is often the wiser choice. And that's all of them. Which of these super fads did you get into way back when? Which ones do you still enjoy today? I would love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed the video, please consider hitting that like button and subscribing to the channel. Thanks for stopping by.